All right, so what I want to do is, um, once again, I've told you this already, but I want to stress it. I was really going to say, well, we don't need to look at VRF and, and look at the configuration. But then I decided to take a peek into the actual you know, core exam and look at the list of um, items and topics they want you to know. And one of the major ones is virtualization 10%. And you'll notice it doesn't just say understand VRF. It says know how to configure it and verify it. And so for that reason, I wanted to take the time to really look at VRF and talk a little bit about it um, so that you can um, get a better understanding of it. Now, obviously, in the book, it talks about VRF. The other thing I want you to know is that this particular section in, the, um, in our online learning, the, the VRF section that is available is very good. And in fact, I pulled uh, the, the pictures out of it that I want to do here. I also uh, looked on the internet for some different items about VRF. But what I want to talk about is what is VRF? And by the way, this is taken from that online class. So I want to make sure you know that I am recording good. Yep. So welcome to our CCMP class, by the way. I apologize, folks. I jumped right in and started, started yapping. But glad everybody's here. Um, but since our actual exam objective says that we need to be able to configure and verify all right, not just know what it is. We're going to go a little more in depth than than we would otherwise. But virtual routing and forwarding, the biggest thing I want you to think about, and I want you to think about that this is basically like doing VLANs, but on a router. So we're going to logically take the router and we're going to break it up into different routing, um, virtualized routing tables so that in those VRFs, in that virtual forwarding that we're gonna do, we're gonna have different tables that we set up depending upon the needs of the network. Now, how is this used normally? Well, there's a couple ways it could be used. One, first off, quick question. Anybody in here ever actually used VRF in a production environment? Anybody in the class actually run VRF in a production environment? If you have, let me know. I have. Okay. Can you, or do you mind explaining, um, who was that that answered, by the way, just so I'm... This is Andrew. Andrew. Andrew, Andrew yes. can, do you mind explaining how you've used it in your environment? You don't, obviously don't have to get in any depth, but just how you used it in your environment. Well, basically what we do, we have um, three different VRS for um, production network for wireless okay. um, visitors and um, for what we call IoT devices. Okay. So we try and separate the networks in a way which, you know, those that don't, don't need to see product, production traffic would not be able to see it. So we segment the traffic accordingly. That's the and, main okay. reason why we use it. And that's one, of the re that's one of the main reasons I've actually heard for using uh, VRFs is for security to be able to basically, when you're breaking them out that way, uh, when you put them in different VRFs, they basically, it's just like two VLANs. They'll pass in the night. They'll never see each other. They really don't even know they exist. Um, another thing that's really cool is with VRFs, you can actually use overlapping IP addresses. You can use the same set of IP addresses in two different VRFs. And because those VRFs don't even know they exist, um, it, it won't cause an overlapping problem. Um, it's interesting, this, you didn't know it, but on most routers you've been using VRF, it's just you've been using the global VRF. You've been using one, the global routing table instead of breaking it into different VRFs. So definitely, thank you, uh, Andrew. Security is one of the things we've seen and that's probably why you've got them that way so that you're securing your traffic uh, apart from the other routing table information. It's also used a that's great correct, deal. Yeah. Go ahead, Andrew, I'm sorry. Andrew, what'd you say? No, I'm saying that's correct for that's security. Correct. Yeah. For security. Another thing it's being used with is multi protocol label switching, MPLS. This is in um, more of the PE, or if you know what a PE is, that's provider network. So provider networks are using uh, BRFs for, for MPLS. In other words, they will create, instead of having to buy two routers, as you see right here, instead of buying two routers, 
to um, handle customer A, one for customer A, one for customer B, which would be crazy expensive and capital cost. What they do is they actually take the router and break it into two different VRFs. And those VRFs <laughs> actually match their MPLS VLANs. And so they can take customer A's traffic, break it off, and it's part of one MPLS VLAN. Okay, and that's, again, we're not showing the MPLS cloud, but there's an MPLS cloud going on um, that allows it to, to tra traverse this traffic. And it uses that to keep the traffic separate from one another. And one, like I said, one of the craziest things I've seen is that you could actually use the same IP addresses uh, on these interfaces. So gig zero zero could be using 11.0 and gig zero two could be using 11.0. Um, and because the VRS are totally separate, it would not cause an issue with the routing. Now it might confuse you, but it is something that can be done if needed. Um, not something I'd really say to do, but it's, it's possible. Okay. Um, questions about this. Like I said, you're just logically breaking the routing table into two separate or more virtual routing tables. Questions about that? Let me jump out here to our... Is there any benefit on it? Just it's going to get shorter or... Uh, the, the benefit is, again, one, in a provider network, you don't have to buy a router to support every customer. The other is security. Uh -huh. it, 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 it actually keeps those, that set of traffic is completely separate from the other VRF. And so that other, okay. they don't even know it exists. Okay. And by the way, it will work both with IPv4 and IPv6, as we can see in our lab. But the main oh, reason is to allow point. you to support multiple vent, multiple customers and keep that traffic separate on a single router. And so even in the route table, so if your customer went to look at or you go to look at the route table, um, you will not even see customer A's routes in the customer B's VRF because those, those VRFs are completely separate. So let's look at our lab. I'm going to open up this one. You'll notice what they've done here. By the way, 90% of this lab is just preparing the lab for uh, some pretty simple VRF commands, which is kind of funny. Um, in fact, you don't even really need the PCs in this. Uh, but you'll notice that we've got customer A up here, and we're going to create a customer A VRF and a customer B VRF. Now, what I have done, and hopefully this will all work correctly because I have built it out. Um, we're going to go, and I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and log in to Netacad. I'm going to log in to Netacad. If you haven't done this live, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make life a little bit easier on you because I've actually got a, uh, I've got the pre-config completely done for it. And I'll just, I'll load that in the class so you won't have to put all the IP addresses and everything on the interfaces, which was 90% of the work in this lab. It's interesting what they did, how they built it out to make it support two different customers though, um, using the, the, the setup. You know, basically this is just here so that you could put these other two on two separate networks. So it's kind of a, it's a good, good overview, good little thing to help you, but it's a, it was just funny how it worked. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and since I am the, oh, quick, Quick thing, I will update you. I know Pastebin has been added. Some of you can't use it because your IT department blocks it. I am in the process of working on getting you uh, Gmail access. Um, so I'm going to be adding Gmail um, to the pod router so that you'll be able to do um, you'll be able to do that. So um, I don't have an ETA at the moment on it, but I am working on it. We're technically on break. We're on. We're actually on faculty break today and tomorrow. But since I was unable to be uh, in class last week, I, I did not want to miss class this week, so I wanted to be here for you. Um, but I'll try next early next week to get these things fixed. And you're on break too, David. There's no break for the wicked. So let me go down here and find my six one three. Reconfigged. 
key after Monday. Yeah, you're right. I spent all day, all day Monday. Well, I didn't do as much of it as my team did, but I was still there to help them in case. Um, but I got, I got a really good team. I really do. They, Brandon and Brian did most of the updates. I let them handle it. And I kind of, I did the uh, state worker, um, hold the shovel equivalent for a, for a state worker. So I'm going to download this pre-config YAML. And now folks, what I've done is if everything's worked right, what we will have once I import this lab is we will actually have all the IP addresses and everything on the lab um, already ready to go. So we don't have to do that. So I dropped that in there just in case you, you didn't want to spend all that time building it. If you're already done the lab, well, just consider it to be a, it was good for you. So what we're going to actually pick up on, we're going to pick up on, as we go through here, um, by the way, you can use these. All you have to do is change these to have gig zero zero. I actually typed everything in just to, to get my, get myself warmed up, but we're picking up right here. We're going to look at how we're going to build the two VRFs. And what you do, as you'll notice on R1, you build the VRFs, you define them and define what address classes or families are gonna use. Then you go in and you assign the IP um, interfaces to, a, um, to the VRF. Now, again, this class requires you to be nimble. Um, oh, wow, install all SSDs. Yeah, that's, that's a job too. That's a full-time job. All right, so this thing should be booting. So we'll go in here and open the console on R1. And once this thing gets up and running, now one of the funny things that happens, folks, I did notice that when you load one of these pre-configs, uh, even if it loads it up and you see that, uh, let's do a in here and you do a show IP and brief, it looks like it's still loading. Oh, and it didn't save my config. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it did. Hold on. Because there's nothing on this one. I forgot about that. But you'll notice it looks like it's still loading. So like R1 or R2 actually up here. Looks like it's still loading. Um, but it's actually loaded and the interfaces are up, even though the little round circle is still there. Um, when you Take the pre-config like I did where you save your config. So again, you go to edit config and you um, update the config. Um, the, it actually takes it as it's booting. It keeps that green round symbol there for longer. So it's, it's not fully booted. It just takes it longer. It will eventually become fully booted, um, but just be aware that you can probably access the devices even though it's showing that it's still trying to boot. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna pull this out over here and I'm going to pull this over here and we're going to access this thing okay so what I want to do is we're going to first define whoop, first we're going to go in global config then we're going to define our VRF so VRF definition all right and you do a question mark you see here it's just some name any name on our lab we have Customer underscore A. Wow, I can't spell. Customer underscore A. Okay. And then we assign address families to it. So let's do address family and look at a question mark here. It's either IPv4 or IPv6 or both. So we're going to do four and then we'll do six. Okay. So we just added both of those to it. Now I'm going to exit just to make it a little bit simpler. And we're going to define our second VRF. Oops, I won't do it because I am still in VRF mode. Let's exit one more time. So VRF definition and now to be customer underscore B. All right. And then again, we're going to do our address family. So address family IPv4. IPv4. And then address family IPv6. And now we have defined. Now let's think about this. We're defining our VRS. Now we're going to go into the interfaces. And remember, we have to use our 
changed interfaces for our lab. So we go to gig zero zero instead of gig zero zero zero. And then we're going to go VRF forwarding customer underscore A. So we have created this VRF and associated the interface with the VRF. Think about how similar that is to another process we do. Okay. What do we do when we create VLANs, folks? Don't we create the VLAN? And then our next item we do is we associate, associate ports with the VLAN, right? Agree, that's what we do on switches? Well, think about with, VR, with VRF, what we do is we create Oh, I cannot, that was, that's supposed to be an R. Create VRF, and then we associate interfaces with the VRF. Yeah, there's VRF. That's, this is a lot harder to do than it looks, folks. Okay, but what I want you to do is, if you can get that similarity in your head, it's like doing a VLAN on the router. We create a VRF and associate it with a VRF. So if we go back in here now, all right, now we put in our IP addresses. So IP add, uh, let's see, this one's 10.1, pull this up so it's right here so we all can see it. 10.1.2.1, 10 255, 255.255.255.0. We do IPv6 add uh, FE80 colon colon one colon one link local IPv6 add oops there's a one colon DB8 colon ACAD colon one zero one two colon colon one slash sixty four Okay, so gig zero zero is, is finished. Do a no shut on it though. Make sure we do a no shut. And we do int gig zero two, which is connected over to R3. We're going to VRF forwarding. And this is again part of the customer AVRF IP at 10.1.3.1. V6 add FE80 colon colon one colon four link local Oops, link local IPv6 add and we'll put in the last one here 201 colon db8 one three colon colon one no shut. All right, so now, folks, even if we stop right now and we do a do show IP VRF interfaces, you'll see we've got two interfaces, 00 and 02, in the customer A VRF. Okay. Now, then we go in and we configure our other interfaces. And in this case, it's gig zero one. So we go int g zero one, which is what we've replaced that one going down to a one. So we're no shut on it. And then we go int g zero one dot five. In cap dot one q five. That just gets it into five VLAN because that's how we're getting it on these two separate networks for D1 and D2, VRF forwarding. And notice we're doing it all the way down on the sub interface. Customer underscore B. And then we got to put our IP address on it. Six, be eight, zero. Notice how they used 
Oops. Oh, forgot my ad. They use the same address that we're used to using DB8, ACAD. By the way, ACAD stands for Academy. If you hadn't put that together, it took me long and it should have to actually figure that out. Shut. Actually, don't even need to know shut here because it's already in the sub interface. Gig 01.8. BRF. Forwarding. B. We're almost done here, folks. You'll notice again, we created the, or put the two interfaces into, oh, I forgot to do my dot one Q, hold on. In cap, dot one Q, eight. Now put my digits in. That tells you, it shows that it's only allowed if it's part of the 8021Q or ISL VLAN. So that's the three one, and then we'll do our IP V6. How many of you were like me and said, man, most of this lab is just doing the basic stuff, but it is part of the actual CCMP. So it wasn't bad to review doing all the, all this, Sub interface routing and those things because that way you get that extra work. Three colon colon one slash sixty four and exit exit right okay. So now if we do a show VRF interfaces show IP VRF interfaces. You see, we've got four interfaces and they're each in a, in a VRFs. So first two are in customer A, second two are in customer B. We can see if we wanna see an, an individual route. And by the way, this is the reason I'm showing this is as we go back over here, configure and verify. So what we're doing now is we're verifying those items. So we're verifying the topics. So as we go down here now, we're looking at these commands that they're going to want you to know so that you can actually do the verification. Show IP route, DRF, customer A, underscore A, pipe, begin gateway. And you'll see there's our interfaces that are in the VRF and the routes that are in the VRF. You also can do a show IPv6 route VRF. You got to spell it right, customer underscore B. And you'll see our IPv6 routes. Notice what happens if I misspell it. It'll tell you immediately. That routing table doesn't exist because the lowercase customer V VRF doesn't exist on the router. You can use the ping VRF command. So ping VRF, customer underscore A, and we'll do 10.1.2.2, which should be R2, and hopefully it's going to work. Boom, there it goes. And you can also do the same thing with IPv6, ping VRF, not VRF, VRF, customer underscore A, 2001, colon DB8, colon ACAD, colon 10012, colon, colon 2. That works. Now, what would you think would happen if I tried to ping? Let's look up here. If I tried to ping 192.168.2.1 from VRFA. Will it work? It should not work because nothing in VRFA, customer A, should be able to get to customer B. So let's try it. Let's do ping VRF 
customer underscore A. And we're going to ping 192.168.2.1. Should fail. And it does, which is correct behavior. So we have created two different VRFs that are completely separate from one another. Now, this is not part of the lab, but I want to try it. And I'm going to let you finish up the rest of the other commands are basically, um, let's see what else I got. If there's any other commands, really see. They basically, we can't ping between the two, but during later in the lab, you'll actually see here, um, they have you create static routes to allow you to ping between the two VRFs. Okay, so there's actually, uh, they create routes for VRFA to VRFB. All right, I'm not gonna do that. I'll let you do that as part of the lab, but they basically create, they, they create routing between the two VRFs by creating static routes. And what they're actually doing, if you think about it, it looks like two fully separate routers because you're actually routing between customer A to get here, you go here and vice versa. So my little nephew just turned 10 wanting to play Fortnite. But what I wanna do, here's what I wanna try and I'm interested in. So we know if we do a show um, IP VRF interfaces. We see that we got 10121, 10131, 10121, 10131. So notice, I might have put in the wrong IP addresses. No, that's right. 10121, Notice we're using the same addresses on both. But we have no issues. We didn't get an overlap message. We didn't get any problem because they're in totally different VRFs. Questions? Questions about VRFs? <clears throat> Anybody? Uh, this lab is not about uh, EI grab, just it's about VRF. Is it correct? Correct. That's all it's about, it's VRF. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All they're trying to get you to do is see that 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 VRF. Uh, actually, actually, Kelly, the, 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 okay. I did the lab, and the, the lab is basically showing that you can have the same IP addresses in the two in the two um, customers. So the one nine two addresses are also the same on both sides. Yep. Yep. They sure are. So basically, right. they're they're showing you that you can overlap completely and not have an issue. That's correct, right? Which is very so, neat. Right. So they're not routing between each other. It's just showing you that on the top is the customer A and B on the bottom, and they're using the same IPs. They are, but now they do set up routing between them. It's so, actually routing to the to the to the other endpoints. We can figure, yeah, R one so the distance can reach each network. Neighbor system will have static routes already configured, so this allows right. you. Yep, allows you to have full reachability across. So that you can source it. So, but again, the big thing is, uh, if you can get in your head that it is like a VLAN, and that that's all you're doing is virtualizing your routing tables. That is a key. I do want you to know, though, like I said, that's it's on the it's in the the actual topics as knowing how to configure. So you may be asked to configure this in a sim, or you may be asked to verify configurations or change a configuration. So for me, the big takeaway is know how to uh, look at your VRFs, look at what's in a VRF. Um, let's do this. Let's do, let's do a show VRF question mark and just see what all we got here. So you can do list customer. So to show VRF customer, customer A, I'll show you what, what it is. Now, this was interesting. I actually did some reading and saw this too. This um, default RD, this is the number that is used with MPLS. So they actually used, put the VLAN ID in here uh, for this default RD. Um, and can anybody remember what RD stands for? That is absolutely, I 
Route, route distinguisher. Route distinguisher. Thank you. RD is route distinguisher, but that is how you use it. Uh, use it with uh, provider networks for MPLS. Um, you, we haven't set it. You can actually set it, but we have not set it um, on this particular setup. So let's see if we can do details. Nope. BRF details. So. God, I can't type. So there we have it. So we can see here, we can see the VRF for customer A, no uh, um, route distinguisher, no VPN ID set. And again, that is, those two would be set if we we're in the MPLS environment, but you won't see that on the, the CCNP test, but still just throw that out there. Uh, we are the address families. This does show you where you're doing both V6 and V4 so that you know that you're doing both inside of here. Um, and so that's one way you could tell what interfaces are in the VRF and what address families are part of that VRF. Look at our counters just to see. So it shows you the number of VRFs that are supported and the current number of VRFs that are in existence on the, on the device. Can do that. Just oh. enjoy list there. Oops. So be aware of those show commands and kind of how you would would do a basic look at VRF and so show VRF, show IP, VRF interfaces. That would be two I would know because um, I could see one of the questions being. Why is um, this particular route not showing up in a VRF? And it could be by doing a show IP IPVRF interfaces, you'll see that it's simply not been assigned to that VRF. All right, other questions? Any other questions on VRF? Any questions on the way we're loading these pre-configs now and how to save it? By the way, if I wanted to save this now, so let's say the lab's finished and I want to save a completed version of it, here's what I would do. Um, I would go to all the nodes, okay? And really you'd only have to go to the nodes you've changed. Um, so I know I've changed uh, R1. So I'm gonna go to edit config and I'm gonna update configuration from device. Okay, yep. Faisal? Uh, yeah, uh, here, two questions. Uh, that basically saving the YAML file is great help. Now, is there any way that, because still we have to upload it to the uh, basically Cisco Academy, is there yeah. any way that we can use maybe Google Drive or something like that? Uh, I am going to allow Google um, Gmail. So okay. Gmail is going to be allowed. Um, okay. And so you can just email them to yourself. And Google Drive may work when I put the Gmail uh, items into the, the, the firewalls, but I am going to go into all the pods and allow Gmail. So you at least have that. Okay. Now, the next question is, while the YAML file is going to do the job for us, is there any way that from those PC, FTP to the router, back up the configuration file like VLAN dot dot and uh, a startup config and all those things and then upload it into, for example, or email it to us? Um, well, if you had Gmail, all you have to do is, so let's say for instance, um, you had this configuration, right? So here's yeah. the, well, we actually start probably down here. Oh, okay. Maybe after yeah, uh, we're can, gonna just, have yeah, exactly like once it's configured, you just come down here. Okay. And you just take it and you would just pull it off of here. So we just go down here and copy okay. it. So we right click, copy, and then okay. um, you know you could do mouse pad or whatever, okay. and then put it in here, and then you could okay. just save it and then email it to yourself. Okay. So, yeah, right. and that's yeah, Thank that gives you the whole much. thing. But now, what I've actually done is I've saved it to the. Oh, let's see, don't say it. Don't say there. I've saved it to the edit config file now to the tab. So okay. I'm done with this. So what I would do is I would just sit here and go download lab. Yeah. 
and save it. And then you could upload this since you're done, upload this yeah. as your assignment. Yeah, very good, very good. Okay, right. thank you very much. So please set up that Gmail for us. It's it's gonna be a great help. Yeah, oh yeah, I will. It's, it's, you, you had to give me the next week though. I don't think I'll get it no done problem. tomorrow. No uh, problem. I'm definitely no problem. not gonna get it done tomorrow. Um, yeah, no problem. But what I would do here I, is like, you could do it like this and then just put your name on it. Yeah, sure. Yes. And I you might want to do final. And then yeah. you could, then you could just upload that into the yeah. Uh, class. Yeah. And that way I have it and I can actually pull it down and look at them if I need to. I can actually open these up. The good news is I can actually open them up with a mouse pad. Yeah. And I can actually go look at your, can see your configs are sitting in here. Yeah. So if you've yeah. got the YAML files, you've got the configs. So see, they're all, all the config is sitting right here. Can I, can I ask some questions here? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Can I go to YAML file and just basically, if we know the format and how it works, just yes. type those information that uh, there, and then automatically we're gonna configure router and switches. Uh, I that I don't know. I think so. I think yes. I think as long as you match this configuration format here. So for instance, if I uh -huh. well, and well, let's try it. Let's do this. Uh, let's go in here. I'm gonna do this. I'm actually gonna define. Yeah. Let's copy this. We'll copy this right here. Yeah. So we'll copy this section and we'll go down here and we'll hit enter a couple times. Yeah. And let's uh, let's paste this. Maybe in. you want to put also a comment there so you know that you added there. Well, I'm gonna know because I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna make this customer C. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, that's great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna define a new, new VRF. Okay, so file, okay. save. All right, and we know that's there. So now what we can do is we can go to Lab Manager. Folks, we're deep in the weeds now on Lab Manager. I'm actually gonna turn this one off so that I have some, I'm gonna import the lab. I'm gonna import my lab. Yeah. Nope, it failed. No, okay. There was something, well, there's something just wrong with what I put in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe not. Okay. But I will say this, there are ways of doing what you're saying because you can, if we had a bunch of labs that were all the same, you can actually yeah. go into your list of devices and you can change the devices to, to have a base config on them. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we're just not doing that because so many of the labs are not the same. Um, so it, it's, it is probably possible to do what, what you want to do. Um, okay. I probably just messed up that file with the... Yeah. With what I put yeah, in. we can look at it later. You know that one is just. Yeah. Well, it, it's a good. It's a good question, though. I mean, it's something to be good to. Yeah. To see. Yeah. So really, all we yeah, got. Yeah, we do can is... look at it later. You know. Yeah, that's good. Well, and really, all I wanted to do today was go over VRF. So um, I'm open to any questions you have. Um, anything you want to to talk about with VRF or anything you want to talk about? I know we're up into OSPF. I do think many of you, as we're looking at the OSPF. Um, especially some of the very first parts of the OSPF. How many of you have been in the CCN, CCNA program for over 10 years? I, raise your hand if you've been in the, with the CCNA program for over 10 years. Okay, good number of us. I know I definitely have. Well, one thing you'll notice, folks, is with OSPF, um, most of the stuff that we've seen or seen in this OSPF is stuff that's been in CCNA previous versions. Now, we're the multi area OSPF, obviously not. Um, but, you know, simple OSPF environments, multiple normal areas, summarization. As far as normal areas go, we're good to go. We've, we've seen that before. Um, what we really need to spend our time looking at is all those different stubby areas, not so stubby areas, totally stubby areas, um, and those things. So that's what we'll be focusing on next week as we talk about OSPF. Yeah. All right. We already work on one of the labs on OSPF. Yeah. Are you have any problems with it? Did everything work okay? No. Yeah. 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 I think, I, I think with, uh, I really do think the OSPF labs are going to work fine inside of, uh, inside of the uh, Netacad um, because it's just, they're, they're pretty simple. Actually, they're pretty simple labs in terms of, of what we're doing with them. It was very straightforward. 
Okay, good, excellent. Thank you. Okay. okay, any other questions today? Like I said, I just want to cover VRF. Uh, Please uh, do not. Question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I don't know if we had mentioned last week, but um, I see we're re Cisco Live. There's this half price for an exam voucher if you register for one by the end of the month. So I don't know okay. if anybody had plans for anything. Okay, so Cisco Live has got a free voucher. Half price? Uh, yeah, half, 50% off. Yeah. Oh, cool. Do you have to sign up for a paid? Uh... No, nothing, nothing at all. I think really? it was just on it. I think if I can find the page now. Yeah, because I'm, I'm going to Cisco Live, by the way. If you haven't, folks, Cisco Live 2021 uh, uh, is free. I mean, I'm a meeting. Sorry. Um, so it is free, um, or they have a free package, and that's what I signed up for, but uh, March 30th and 31st. In fact, we will probably, what, I think that is a Thursday, Friday, isn't it? No, it's a Tuesday, Wednesday. I strongly recommend going to that if you have not, um, or if you haven't signed up for it, but Cisco Live is free. I also will tell you this, folks. Once COVID's over, save your money and go to Cisco Live for real, um, because it is probably the single best conference I, I go to, period. Um, I, I enjoy it, and I think I learn more there than any other um, any other conference that I go to, quite honestly. Um, but go ahead and register now for the free event. I'm already signed up and already in it, but um, I didn't know about uh, the, the half price exam. Basically, that's that's something good to know. Usually, you get I, yeah, I just type. <clears throat> I typed in Cisco Live exam voucher, and I see the page comes up on learningnetwork.cisco.com, but a page comes up with the information. That's Cisco learning credits to... I put in Cisco Live exam voucher, Cisco Live 2021. I'm in the dashboard here. I don't know if. I've got the Explorer pass. Well, I'll look around and see what we can find. Um, right. Well, if you, yeah. I could share the screen, but at least you could see which page it is. Yeah, yeah, let me do that. I'll, uh, let me give you the ability to share screen. I'll stop mine. Just remember, I'm, I am recording, so you don't want anything that you don't want anybody else to see. <laughs> Go ahead. Basil. He could just send you the link, right? Yeah, uh, true. I could just send the link in the in the chat. Uh, let me do that. Do but that this too. is the the page here at Okay. And uh, this offer here, one written exam, fifty percent off. Okay. And cool. you have you have to register before the first of April. Oh, that's a good deal there. Yeah. Let, let me just send the link. Yeah, send, in that. The... send that to me. And I'll I'll also email that to the class. Cool. Very, very good. Okay. Drop that in the chat and I will, everybody can grab it out of chat and I also will take it uh, and put it on, put it on uh, in an email to everybody. Thank you. That saves us, that saves everybody a lot of money if they want to try it. Um, the other thing I wanted you to know um, is I'm going to, let's go ahead and stop recording now.